Conversations with Iris. We have two special guests. Uh, we have Hannah, an asylum seeker from Albania, and Pip, who is head of Ad policy and advocacy at Refugee Women Connect. Today, we would like to discuss uh, issues that have emerged from our report on the impact of COVID-19 on forced migrants in the UK. One of the, what we have seen that coronavirus have exposed different inequalities uh, in our society, and we have seen deteriorating realities for many migrants in the country. But perhaps could we begin from asking you to introduce yourself and how has the coronavirus affected your life so far? Yeah, my name is Hina and I come from Albania, how Sandra said before. It's seven years I'm living here, nearly seven years I live here in England. And uh, yeah, the life has changed, I think, for everyone, not just for us, how we are asylum seekers. I struggle one week. <laughs> it's, it's mad to say this, even when I speak to my friends and I say, I've been a week looking around for nappies for my son. Oh my God, I went everywhere in Liverpool to find them nappies and I couldn't find it. Mm. And yeah, now it's getting a bit better, but it was so hard. You get stressed, what's gonna happen? You're scared. And when you don't have like enough money to buy things for your family, you always scare if this is gonna finish, I'm gonna be able to get any more. It's gonna be any more in stores. So it was really, really hard. Mm, yeah, lots of worries. And yeah. it came really unexpected for all of us. And for for you, Pip, and Refugee Women Connect, how has the situation affected your work and what sort of help have you been offering during this period to people who were most affected? Well, um, so as soon as um, as lockdown came in, obviously we had to um, to move all of our face to face services to uh, to, to virtual formats. Um, uh, the you know we, we used to run a lot of um, drop in uh, sessions, um, outreach sessions, and, um, and and a lot of mental health um, uh, groups as well, um, like both group work and one to one, and and all of these had to shut sort of overnight, and everything had to be adapted to um, as I said to online tools using online tools. Mm -hmm. um, the real challenge though was that um, I mean across the country we've. You know, the, the internet and, and our connectivity is, has been key to keeping in touch, to seeing our doctors, to um, doing our work, to getting information. But with this, with this group of women that, that we work with, um, we, uh, we found that, that they don't often you know, have, uh, they don't have Wi-Fi and asylum accommodation. Uh, they don't um, necessarily have data for their phone. Um, they don't have. Um, they don't even have credit for their phone. So when they're trying to make, um, you know, to, to to make ends meet on on, this, on asylum support, and, and I think I don't know Hannah may be able to shed more light on this, but but that was one of the big um, big problems that we had was actually at like reaching um, reaching these 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 um, service users. Is that was that your experience too, Hannah? Yeah, it was. Um, so what we've uh, what we've had to do, we've, um, I, we've sort of diverted budgets from um, you know, money that we would we would give to people to uh, to come to get bus tickets or money we'd spend on refreshments or um, I don't know uh, on room hire in the, the the places that we ran the groups that that would go to um, to topping up phones. Um, but it was, um, but just for the, you know, it's it's not just the services that we provide. It was it was things like uh, actually getting getting information from, you know, on C nineteen on on health advice on, um, you know, getting getting information from um, the service the the home office um, contractors who who actually provide these you know who are meant to be be looking after people. Um, yeah, I mean that that was, but but yeah, we we basically we we went online. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hannah, as an asylum seeker, how did you feel during this crisis, especially awaiting the decision I, from the home office? Yeah, it affected even my case because before 
the lockdown, I was preparing to do appeal for my case. So everything is stopped. So now I don't know what's going to happen. Mm. And it stopped mainly because of this, the online appeals yeah. were went on because hold. Uh, first, I think it was the first person who had uh, who became positive in uh, coronavirus. It was my solicitor. So before the lockdown start, she locked down herself. Mm -hmm. okay. South by as a lady, you know what they call. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, she she stopped, I think, a week or two before the lockdown. So she stopped doing everything. So she started in the beginning. She sent me all the paperwork to sign it and post it to her. But I said, I cannot do it anymore because it's expensive for me doing two, three times a week this thing. So what happened is going to happen. I have to stop because mm -hmm. I cannot do it like sending two three pound every week mm. paying for the post to send it to you so i stopped everything yes yeah, a substantial cost and other respondents in our study shared similar concerns that they could not continue their asylum seeking cases because they were afraid of accessing post offices with their children they were afraid for their children yeah. to be contract, to contract the disease the pandemic restrictions really affected their well-being and their mental health well-being like lots of women we've spoken with shared um concerns around um being alone and not being able to rely on anybody i don't know how was it in your case did you have do you have some people that you can rely on no do just no just refugee women connect and uh, uh, before they bring this and um, like washing liquids and things for me at home because people donate it and they bring it to us mm -hmm. but no one else what could you say something hannah about the face to the 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 face-to-face -face services and how that you know how that affected you going from face to face to to doing things like this doing things on zoom it, and on the phone it's really sad you cannot meet people yeah. who who've been there always for you and support you with anything you needed or it's it's really important even if someone doesn't give you anything but give give attention to you and listen and you like you can open and tell you things what's going on in your life it's mm -hmm. really important and is this is changed now we do like meeting every thursday now with a list and it's it's still good, but it's not like before. It's not the same. It doesn't feel the same. Yeah. How was it for you to stay home for so long and for the kids? How is the situation? Really hard. Really hard. We we try to understand, but even for us, it's not that easy to accept. You have to stay just inside. It's not easy even for us, but for kids, it's more is double mm. hard for them because they cannot understand and you try yourself your best they don't hear the news because the news will scare them how many does we have mm. so they will be scared of what's going on so i explained to my kids is a virus around to my daughter so my son is just two years old so he cannot understand why the reason and all the things but my daughter she's six so I explained to her, it's a virus going around the world. So we need to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. So you are doing your best to protect them from all yeah. the information. Yeah. Well, as, a, as a mother, it's, it's really hard in these times. But yeah. People, I wanted to ask you, uh, what people are most affected? Who are, who are the people who, who need your support most in this crisis? Well, um, so I guess one of the main concerns we've had is um, with women who have underlying traumas, so who maybe were accessing secondary mental health services um, for experiences they had before, um, and who 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 then sort of in a situation where those traumas and that isolation is compounded by um, you know by the lockdown. 
So kind of what Hannah was saying about, you know, taking away those face-to-face -face services. Um, I mean, there were a lot of mental health um, counseling support that, that just had to be stopped. So it wasn't even an option anymore. Um, so we've, you know, our mental health team has been really um, busy with doing one-to-one -one phone check-ins and, um, and doing and doing one-to-one -one sort of Zoom uh, calls when they can. Um, we also find that um, women, um, you know, with children, I guess, like like Hannah, but what Hannah's um, describing does resonate. We've we've found that um, that women who are who are on their own looking after children, particularly struggling, um, you know, who who or who are the main carers for for children or other family members. Um, yeah, Hannah, Hannah, what Hannah describes is quite common. What we've what we've seen. So women feeling they're not able to um, to, to adequately homeschool their kids, um, feeling like they, um, they they can't do it with with Wi-Fi, um, and also struggling to make asylum support stretch far enough. Um, now that food is more expensive or less, you're less able to get those basics like those cheaper basics like rice and pasta and things, particularly earlier on. And then if they were um, self-isolating and needing to, 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 or needing to quarantine for two weeks, that was almost impossible um, to actually buy the food that you would need for two weeks, especially when you don't get your asylum support in, that, in, the, in the lump sum enough to, to do that. Um, we've also had um, like, you know, trouble like, with transport. So um, the ART cards or the um, Aspen cards, they're not, you can't use them on, on buses. So buses stopped taking, uh, taking change and you had to, you could only use contactless cards. And it's these little things that I think that um, really make a difference. And I think you don't, it's like, like the access to Wi-Fi, the access to phone credit, the, you know, the ability to, to, to pay contactless. These are all, we assume that everyone has those resources available to them and they can um, adapt with all, all the services that have had to adapt across the UK, so mainstream as well as specialist. But, um, you know, like you, people don't realize, I think that, you know, how, how challenging it is for really like really small um, practical things so can create really huge challenges. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, those are the essentials that many people t and maybe ourselves we sometimes take for granted. Mm -hmm. I always well dream about social justice, but this crisis just reminds me of how far we are, how, how far away we are from achieving social justice, even in the UK and other countries where our research took place. Um, perhaps to moving forward, let's think about how we see the future and what needs to change. Like, Hannah and Peep, what and myself, what do we want to see? I hope that the crisis will not aggravate. I hope we will, we, all countries will recover and the pandemic will pass or it will be history, but it might be the case that potential future crisis will happen. What do we think should change? Uh, well, as soon as possible now, but also for future. I want the virus to go. <laughs> That's the first thing. And biggest thing I think it's in everyone's mind and heart that soon as soon as the virus go and get to normal life, be used to them. But it's gonna take long for us to uh, to accept it. The virus is gone. You feel like you feel bad even when you see someone in your front or someone outside and you used to give each other a hug and you cannot do it anymore. You've been under the system for seven years and, and, and you know as well as anyone um, working in this sector that, um, that there, there are huge cracks in the system to, you know, to begin with. You know, there were charities, um, food banks, we were all having to plug gaps in, in, um, in the shortfall of asylum support and really enabling um, asylum seekers and refugees to, uh, to meet their very basic needs. And I think like this, this crisis really has um, exposed how um, you know, this huge lack of resilience in the system. And, um, and I do think like it's given us an opportunity as a sector to really come together and, 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 and sort of um, highlight what um, you know the cruelties of it, and and I mean I'm really hoping that 
now that the the system has been tested to breaking point um that that maybe there would be a, a different way of thinking about how we are fulfilling our duty of care to asylum seekers who who are legitimately seeking asylum in, in the uk or, or any um any migrant groups really thank you very much for your time and chatting to us we've been very lucky to have peep and hannah in conversations of iris 